Anyway, um, lots of things to pray for. And so before we get started here, let's lift all that up. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, just bringing us again, Lord. We, we know that uh, you're our provider, and uh, Lord, you do uh, great work in, in just providing and blessing and giving us gifts. And so we lift up all those, those needs available or those needs uh, that are uh, needing, uh, you know, your your provision, Lord, and uh, so we just lift all that up to you. Uh, we want to pray for that community outreach, uh, also as a church body, that, that Lord, we know that some of us are going to participate in prayer, some of us are going to be hands-on in that, but uh, Lord, we just ask for your leading and your blessing, and that it would be fruitful, and and also for the various outreaches in the prison and the healthcare facilities and you know, things like that, Lord. Um, and just, you know, that we would uh, learn your word, uh, that we would grow as a body uh, to do the work of the ministry as your word, you know, declares that we should. And so, Lord, just help us to take what we learn and, um, and just to trust you with it and to glorify you. And so today, as we would study again in the book of Leviticus, we just pray that, that you would lead and guide. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Leviticus again. And, um, you know, again, we study Leviticus. Why? Because it's God's word. It's God's word. <laughs> Everybody should know that by the end. Of, we, we've been in, uh, this is our 15th week in Leviticus, and I think every Sunday I said the same thing, so I'm glad somebody answered. I figure most of you probably thought of it, but anyway, because it is God's word, and, um, and so um, last week I had stressed that it's important that the strategy, uh, studying the word, and the battle plan, I mentioned because we took in the whole chapter 13 last week, uh, 59 verses, and I had mentioned, it took me nine minutes and 13 seconds to read it. And that's what would be dedicated to the service in the reading of God's word. And this week, when I read chapter 14, it took six minutes and 58 seconds. I don't know why. Maybe I had a better pair of glasses on or something. <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that one out. But the point being, and, uh, and then I divided that up into five readings and uh, so that we could you know, encapsulate parts of it and then study it and focus to learn it. Um, And then as I'm studying, I realized I couldn't get through the whole chapter this week. So I got down to like, I don't know, 32nd verse, I think it is. And so anyway, but it's important just to have, you know, that perspective going out there. And before we read the first verses, each time I give an introduction to... uh, the study, the title of this study is Outside the Camp. And, um, and I've given various studies. I've never given a personal testimony, though, study or uh, introduction to this book of Leviticus, which I like to do right now because I was reminded that when I went to high school, back in, I went to high school from 71 to 75. And this was the time during the Jesus people uh, you know, movement, if you ever heard of that. God was just doing amazing things in the country, uh, all over. Uh, young people were getting saved by the tens of thousands. And uh, there was this one girl that went to uh, our high school and she uh, got saved. And, um, and so we shared a study class together that was in the library each day and she would bring her Bible and we could use that time however we wanted to. And so, um, and so she would bring her Bible and she would uh, share with me the things that she was learning at church and her church was my first church after I got saved, Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa and they went through the entire word of God and so as a new believer, she happened to be going through the book of Leviticus. And so she didn't know anything about the Bible, so what she would do is just pass on what she learned, you know, the week before. And so she would open her Bible, she was pretty bold, and she'd say, and, you know, 
and she was really cute, so I would like want to hear what she had to say, you know. And so she would open Leviticus and she'd say, okay, so read that. And she had the King James. And I would be sweating bullets because I didn't, you know, didn't want to act dumb. And so I'd be reading it, stumbling over my words, and then she'd ask me, so what, so what did that mean? And I'd desperately try and come up with the answer. And, and she would do that week after week after week. This is in our senior year. And, uh, and then we graduated in June. And then in July, I received Christ. Because as we we're going through Leviticus, the Lord was convicting me of various things. And, this, and, and uh, the word just became alive to me just from the book of Leviticus. Because as you're studying, and of course, other things are mentioned and thought of and thought through and so forth. And so the Holy Spirit used the book of Leviticus to get my attention. That's my personal testimony. And so why do we study the book of Leviticus? Because it's God's word, which is what? Living, sharper than a two-edged sword. The Holy Spirit uses his word to minister to our hearts. And that's... And so, uh, once again, we're not sure the things that the Lord's going to show us at any given time, but, uh, you know, it does tell us in the book of uh, Isaiah, and it says that the Lord's word never returns void, goes out, accomplishes what it does, does its work in our hearts, and doesn't return void. And so, um, and so, uh, the, the last week uh, in the introduction, um, I had really talked about the subject of leprosy. Not to repeat all of that, because this is kind of a part two, this study, but God has given his people safeguards through instruction. And we've learned that. And, um, and so regarding this uh, uh, leprosy, it really was to keep diseases from spreading and infecting others. And so a simple application to all that is how we might deal with sin. If you thought about leprosy as sin, and all of us being one, bar, one body, the body of Christ, and how uh, it's instructed to the church to deal with sin when it's blatant and all of that, so that it doesn't infect the body. Paul uses the analogy as a little leaven, leaven the whole lump. And so there's an application there regarding that. And so he addresses uh, leprosy so that that wouldn't happen. And so the title, once again, Outside the Camp. And so in these first verses, I want to read uh, verses 1 through 9. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying... This shall be the law of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall examine him. And indeed, if the leprosy is healed in the leper, then the priest shall command to take for him who is to be cleansed two living and clean birds, cedar wood, uh, scarlet, and hyssop, and the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. And as for the living bird, he shall take it, uh, the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop, and dip them and the living bird in the blood of the, the bird of that which was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it even seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose in the open field, he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes, shave all of his hair, and wash him in water, and he may be, that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and, and shall stay outside his tent seven days. But on the seventh day, he shall shave all the hair of, off his head and off his beard and his eyebrows and his hair. He shall shave off, he shall wash his clothes and wash his body in water, and he shall be clean. And so, interesting, again. <laughs> uh, remember chapter, chapter 13, it dealt with identification of leprosy and also its characteristics. And this chapter deals with the cleansing and uh, the sacrifice associated with it. 
And so, you know, like a Christian, we have to first identify the problem, and, uh, and then after that, we know we are the problem, right? Identify, identify the problem. What is it? Us. <laughs> and then uh, we recognize that we're sinners, and then as verse 2 really shows there, uh, with the cleansing comes sacrifice. And notice verse 3 there, uh, the leper couldn't come into the camp. Notice the priest had to go outside the camp there in verse 3. And so in that, this speaks of the law of the leper for the day of cleansing, verse 2. And so here was the leper, remember, separated, hopeless, helpless. His condition was, you know, without, you know, any remedy. And like a sinner, without Christ. And the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in that helpless state. And so we have now Christ to cry out to. And so here's this leper who you can just imagine where it says this is the law of the leper regarding cleansing. And when you hear that, as a leper, you would say, bring it on. This is the law of cleansing? Bring it on. Bring it into my life. Imagine the good news of cleansing when you're a leper. That would be like the guy who gets the good news of being cancer-free. It's like when we're saved. I'm free from sin. That's the connection. And not no longer a sinner, just like that person who gets the, you know, I'm cancer-free. Well, guess what? We all have cancer cells in our body. What they're really saying when you say cancer-free of the cancer that was killing you, that was identifiable, that cancer that was going to take you out is gone. Doesn't mean that you don't have no more cancer cells in your body, but you've been free to the cancer that you were concerned with. It's like the sinner. Hey, we're saved by God's grace. It doesn't mean that I'm not a sinner, but guess what? The sin that was going to kill me, the sin that was going to judge me, I'm free from. And now we live life from a whole different perspective. And a lot of times people don't know. Hey, what's bringing me down? Why am I depressed? If you, know, you went in the doctor and you say, you have cancer, would that change your way of thinking? Most people it would. I know some people that it might not. I have cancer? All right, that means I'm just going home a lot sooner. But some people would just be drugged down, the weight, the pressure, the thought of illness and pain and agony. And pretty soon, day after day after day, they'd be consumed with the fact that, how could I get rid of this cancer? And their whole life would be, I want to get rid of this cancer. That's what most people respond by. And so there's people living life like that, wondering why, when they need to be delivered from their sin. They need their Savior to say, you're free. And then once that news hits their ear and salvation takes place, they go, oh my goodness, that's what it was that was bringing me down into the depths of depression, always longing for something more, never content. And that's what it is. It was the cancer of sin eating them up. And so this leper gets the news. It's the law of cleansing. Bring it on. And notice the priest, again, does all. Not the leper. The leper can't do anything. The leper just one day says, wow, I think this leprosy is gone. The priest comes and does all. He has to even go outside the camp. The leper couldn't even come inside the camp. So the priest goes out out of the camp. Why? Because the leper was an outcast. The leper was trailing the camp, remember? Pronounced unclean, separated from his family, quarantined. And so here he is trailing with no hope, just looking on, no longer able to connect with those he loves so much, those he values so much so that he wouldn't infect them. And so there he's, he's trailing. And then, and then he gets the word that 
he's healed, so he calls for the priest. And then you notice from verses 4 down to verse uh, five, 4 and 5 there, it speaks of all that the priests bring, the clean birds, or those birds that would be the acceptable sacrifice, plural. Then there's the wood, and of course the wood represents the cross, and then there's the scarlet, represents the blood and the hyssop. And you remember when Jesus was on the cross, they, they dipped the hyssop into vinegar and offered him a drink there. And so you see a representation of the cross there, but what I want to highlight there is the word earthen, for earthen vessel, because the Bible says that the word, which is Jesus Christ, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. The word became earthen, became flesh. And so when we look at this description of the two birds, it really typifies Christ in the sense that you have two stages. You have his death and you have his resurrection. And so here, we know Jesus was crucified in weakness. And then there you have the lamb and you have the dove. Gentleness, weakness. That's the characteristics of those two animals sacrificed by their blood for the symbolism of the healing necessary through Jesus Christ. And what did that look like? As Think about the gentle doves, and one is killed, and then the overrunning water, which speaks of, you know, again, living water and cleansing, but the blood is put on the wings of the living bird and then the living bird is set free to fly into the heavens. What did that look like? Well, you know what? I've never seen it. But I was at a wedding last Saturday and uh, a family that I've known for a really long time and the, the two that were getting married, they had just lost their grandparents. And uh, the one, the grandfather of the groom, I knew was a very good friend of mine who had uh, died, went to heaven to be with the Lord. And both of the, and then, and then the, the bride lost her grandmother, both of them within just months before their wedding. Matter of fact, it was the plan of the groom to have his grandfather, Daryl, as his best man. And so both of them, just prior to, you know, the ceremony being completed, wanted to remember and honor their grandparents. And so they brought in two big helium balloons and they held them and then they let them go in honor of their grandparents. And that captivated me. Why? Because I knew Daryl so well. That's why I was even at the wedding. That's why I was invited there. Neat brother. Went to be with the Lord. And I just watched that balloon. They were about the size of these globes right here. Just for reference. And, and it started just to float up into the heavens. And then it became, it, you know, I watched it. I stepped back because it was an outdoor wedding. And I stepped back and I just watched it. And I watched it. I kind of dis. I kind of, you know, I couldn't help myself. I had to kind of just stop listening to everything that was going on there in the wedding ceremony because I was just captivated by that. My heart and tears started to flow because I thought, you know, here that was just, you know, symbolic of, hey, Daryl's in heaven, man, and that balloon's just soaring away, you know, towards heaven. And I don't know what that was like when that dove was, the wings were dipped in the blood and it soar, it went away. But can you imagine the leper who was healed watching the law of the cleansing being, you know, demonstrated? And he saw the blood on the wings just flying away. How freeing that must have been. The anticipation of knowing that he's about to be reunited with his family. And so... It had to be that sense like that that just would captivate anyone. And you see there in verse 7, when the 
leper is found clean, you shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in the open field. Now, prior to that, remember in chapter 13, verse 45, the only recourse that the leper had was to cover himself and to yell, unclean, unclean, to identify him. Stay away, I'm unclean. That's the only recourse he had. And now he hears clean as this live bird is let go. I mean, that had to be so amazingly impact to the person the symbolism there of life and restoration as that bird just flew into the sunset or wherever. And so, who's our high priest? Jesus Christ, who says, you are clean through my blood. And now, we, only, we don't only identify with the fellowship of his suffering, like Paul says, but also the power of the resurrection. And that's the hope that is given to us. And so after that, after that, he shall come into the camp there in verse 8. Not until then he could come into the camp and he would shave all his hair and wash his clothes so that, and he shall be clean. And this was a pronouncement of cleanness. It wasn't like, well, so how do you feel about that? You know, the lepers never asked how he felt about it. No, he's pronounced clean. The blood was shed. And then he afterwards shaved his hair and washed. Only after the leper was allowed into the camp. And then there was something he could do. You know, like, for lack of better terms, clean up his act. It wasn't before, but only after that he could do anything to clean up his act. You think about that. You know, it's like the idea of catching fish. Well, you never think about, uh, well, let's clean the fish and then catch it. No, you catch the fish, the smelly, slimy, dirty fish, and then it gets cleaned up. Not before. And so it's not until you're clean by Jesus Christ that then you can start working on anything in your life to clean it up. And so, and also, this process in the Bible is called sanctification. And uh, and really, it's a lifetime work. Because, you know, there's a lot of ground to cover between now and heaven. And there's a lot of adjustments that we're going to be making along the way because God's going to be growing us up and cleaning us up. And, you know, we're going to be able to stand holy. And so, and so in this next, uh, next section, next section, verses 10 through 18, Let's go ahead and read that together. And on the eighth day, he shall take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour, mixed with oil as a grain offering and one log of oil. And the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who is in is to be made clean and those things before the Lord and at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall take one male lamb and offer it as trespass offering and the log of oil and, and, and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he shall kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place for as the sin offering is the, is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed and on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his foot. The priest uh, shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest shall dip his right finger in the the oil 
that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his, his finger even seven times before the Lord. And of the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest shall put some on the top of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood, on the blood of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed so that the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. And so that is to happen on the eighth day there in verse 10, notice. Eight is the number that speaks of new beginnings, starting the newness of life as a cleansed leper, as those of us would be cleansed from our sin. In newness of life, new beginnings. Now, if you look from verses 10 to 12, the entire range of sacrifices are mentioned there that we studied from chapters 1 to chapters 7. But the first that is applied to the leper, verse 12, is the trespass offering. Now, the trespass offering gives context to the leper as being one who is needing deliverance from trespass. And so if you compare, then you compare a leper with a transgressor. So it kind of helps understand then how the sacrifice is applied. But you have a lamb, you have the flour, you have grain, you have oil. And remember the principle, this also provides for the priest. The priest would uh, be working and the Lord would be providing for him and also for his family. And there's that variety of sacrifices that are provided for. And then if you notice that if you drop down to verses 14 through 16, we see the, the symbolism in the blood. The blood applied to the leper, his ear, his hand, his foot... And when you think about that blood, it's showing that it speaks of dedication of the whole person. And so the whole person is being dedicated to the Lord, and that's the atoning work of the blood on the ear for hearing, on the hand for doing, and on the foot for walking. And so um, there's that healing that has come upon the man. And so before that, what could a dead man do? That's the idea. Spiritually speaking, what could a dead man, where could a dead man walk? Regarding life in Christ, you could not until you are made clean. And so there's that dedication, that healing. If this didn't happen without the healing, there would be only the life of the leper. The leper without the healing would live as a leper where his life would be plagued. In other words, everything that would define joy would be gone. But that's, see, that's why the Bible says for us who have the joy of salvation and the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we experience that new life. And so like us, if you were to take away our salvation then you would be taking away everything that is of value. We would have a different perspective. Why do I say that? Well, because everything would become temporal. You take away the joy of salvation in Christ and everything becomes temporal. See, the Bible says we're to have an eternal perspective. But you take away Christ, everything becomes temporal. Everything becomes short-lived. The value of everlasting life, the value of our loved ones living forever with the Lord and in his heaven goes away. We lose that. And you know what? If you lose sight of eternity, that is a life changer in this life. It's a life changer. Then you start thinking about averages. Well, let's see, I think I lived about half my life on the average. Now what? I didn't get a chance to do my bucket list or whatever. 
I got to hurry up. I never amounted to anything. I never got to live my dreams and so forth and so on. You know what? None of that affects the believer whose sights are set on heaven. This is the worst it's ever going to get for the believer, but this is the best it's ever going to be for the unbeliever. And we have our sights set on heaven. Why? Because that's eternal. And so it doesn't matter what God's call is for you here. You can settle in. That's okay. I can be content in that. But oh my goodness. When I take my last breath here, I take my first breath there. That's exciting to think about. So as you age, you don't suddenly become more, you know, hopeless. Instead, you become more anticipating the fact that you're going to be with Jesus soon, either in the rapture or in natural, natural ways. And we don't know when that's going to be. My neighbor is 104. My wife went over to visit her the other day, and it was a wonderful visit, visit they had. And she brought her dinner, and she was so excited. She told my wife, oh, I didn't know what I was going to eat you know, tonight. And she has a sweet tooth. So she also brought over this, te- this chocolate cake that is to die for. And she was so excited about being able to eat it. 104. And she's as sharp as a whip. She thinks she outthinks me every time I visit her. You know? So we don't know when that time's going to be. But we're to live today serving Jesus Christ. Because you know what? We can't outgive the Lord. You hold back, guess what? He does too. Sorry. It's just a principle. It's a principle. You want more for me, myself, and I? Then guess what? God holds back too. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm just talking about, you know, the, I don't know, uh, the vibrancy of life that he gives. And he's so faithful to do. So you notice that that was the blood preceded the oil. Because if you look at verse 16, then the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil. You know, once in a while I mentioned the fingerprint of God on things. Oh, God's fingerprints was all over that. This might be where I got it from, I'm not sure. But I was excited to see the finger in the oil from the priest. But this is a necessary sequence. Acceptable works cannot precede acceptable sacrifice. You have to first be born again, then you can do the works of the Lord because the oil, you notice, is placed on the blood. And so the blood was the the primer, you might say. Got it all started. Got the heart, the spiritual heart going. And then the oil. The oil is the finisher. And Paul, you know, as again, as I mentioned, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. They go together. You can't have one without the other. That's why daily you're to pick up your cross and follow him. Why? Always remembering the, sac- the great sacrifice that allows you the great power to follow him. That's why. That's why there's that sequence that we're to be reminded of. And so the oil follows always representing the holy spirit in the bible and so the significance as one being cleansed now and made whole we can be anointed by the holy spirit able to hear the things of the lord able to serve the lord able to be about our father's business in the name of the lord and this third section and final four today Verse 19, then the priest shall offer the sin offering and make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from the uncleanness after he shall kill the burnt offering. The priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar, so the priest shall make atonement for him and he shall be clean. But if he is poor and cannot afford it, then he shall take one male lamb as a trespass offering to be waived to make atonement for him, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, a log of oil and two turtle doves or two young pigeons, such as he is able to afford. One shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. 
He shall bring them to the priest on the eighth day of his cleansing to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil. The priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it on the tip of the ear of him who is to be cleansed on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall pour some of the oil in the palm of his own left hand and the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. The priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of his right, uh, on, the, on the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the trespass offering. The, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons as he can afford, such as he is able to afford, the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering, with a burnt offering, so the priest shall make atonement for him who is to be cleansed before the Lord. This is the law of one who had a leprous sore who cannot afford the usual cleansing. Now, too much to share about that <laughs> because I'm, I'm out of time. Now, from this verse, the subject changes. But the main thing to realize here is that this is the details of the poor man who could not afford, and I love this here, where it says, this is the law again. At the end of verse 2, it's a reminder before it switches gears to the house. But it says, this is the law. And again, you have to believe that they, they would say, bring it on. Because you know what? If that law is applied to my life, it will be, I will bring, it'll be deliverance. See, the, uh, the law misapplied brings bondage. The law correctly applied brings freedom. And so God's law, remember, is always comes through the lens of grace. And so here he hears verse 32, you know, it's the law of who cannot afford the usual uh, cleansing. And so, you know, the poor man, he couldn't afford, you know, the two lambs. He might not even be able to afford the one lamb. But what he could afford, he brings the birds. See, the birds, even a poor man can trap some birds. And so even a poor man can bring the birds. The one thing that had to always be representative, we're going to go over this section without having to read it next week, but I have to mention these few last thoughts, is the blood had to apply even to the poor man. But see, the poor man was not hindered to bringing himself in full devotion to the Lord. And so there was, and then I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 55 to finish with this last verse here. Isaiah 55, looking at uh, verse 1. It says, Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. What do we know about thirst? When you're thirsty, it's all consuming. And so, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. And so, a person has a spiritual thirst. And what happens is it would be as foolish as a man who has physical thirst to say, I'm so thirsty, give me some bread. No, that's the wrong thing. That won't satisfy. Give me a ribeye steak. I'm so thirsty. That will not do it. 
And so as the spiritual man cries out, I'm so thirsty, I'll pursue that. I'll pursue that to no satisfaction. But God calls us to himself. The invitation is exclusive. Then he goes on to say, what do you spend money for? What is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. And that's the promise of God to us. And so I encourage you, I certainly don't know where you're at this morning regarding the Lord, but I encourage you, if you've been one that is out pursuing other things and not the Lord, or, you know, if you've got to the point where, you know, your heart's grown cold to the Lord, and maybe one time you made a commitment to the Lord, and I, su- su- I suggest you come up here and we pray and just start your walk in newness, that eighth day, a new beginning with the Lord, and just see what God doesn't do in blowing your minds with his goodness. Amen. You go from being, feeling like a leper, all dirty, to being cleaned up, never perfect, but God does wonders, doesn't he? In our lives, when we just turn them over to him, we have hope from hopelessness, re- restoration from one who's broken down. God does that, so amen. Let's stand together. So, Father, thank you so much for your love, Lord. And once again, we thank you for your word. We just ask that it would be you, Lord, who is glorified in our lives. I pray for each one here. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, capture our hearts, each one of us, Lord and that we would look to you every day. And I pray for any that might be struggling in here today, and I just ask that today would be the day that they'd turn over their life to you. Lord, you know where each person's at. We don't. Only you know the heart, Lord. We don't even know the, you know, the degree of our own heart. And so I just ask that you would do that supernatural work in our heart and our lives. Lord, we want to thank you for all those that prepared food downstairs. Thank you for them, Lord, and their service. I pray that you nourish us with the food that's prepared and that you would bless our fellowship around the table. We give you thanks today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Now, come on up here afterwards if you want, and we'll pray for you up here.